Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Opportunity in Chaos webinar. I'm Mark McAllister, Senior Partner for Holborn, based here in Cape Town. Uh, today's event is designed to help you understand what is happening right now in global markets and how to decipher what that means for you and your financial future. Uh, thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Uh, please let me begin by introducing my fellow speakers. Um, so first up, Lawrence Reichardt is our managing partner for the African region. He maintains and grows an existing client base both in South Africa and globally, uh, whilst also building a dynamic, resilient IFA team uh, by providing them with guidance and support in order to dominate the financial services industry on the African continent. He's led Africa, um, Holborn Africa, sorry, for a, uh, from a team of six to nearly 85 over the last four years whilst also simultaneously chairing the Investment Selection Committee uh, res with responsibility for circa three billion US dollars of client assets across the group. Um, joining Lawrence from VAM is Rob Gordon, one of the industry's great voices of reason, uh, a seasoned manager of multiple well-known brands such as Bank of America, Fidelity, Treehouse, uh, and over a number of decades, um, Rob, um, thank you very much also for taking the time to join us all the way from Boston here today. So welcome to Lawrence, welcome to Rob. Okay, let's uh, let's move on and get straight to it. So nothing too dramatic. Lawrence, what's this all about? Thank you, Mark. Uh, yes, it's always a great uh, opportunity to chat to people, and I don't think we could have timed this webinar better. Um, the convergence of various different factors around the world is, uh, is causing virtually every news channel um, that you can think of. It's causing all sorts of problems out there at the moment for investors. Let's start with the first one in front of you. Inflation is at a 40 year high in the developed world. We have not seen inflation like this since Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States. This is a big question mark on everybody, uh, on everybody's lips is what are we going to do with this huge inflation? But then if we look further ahead, we see that interest rates are now put in, being put up by the central banks, by the Federal Reserve at such alarming rates, 25 basis points, then 50 basis points, maybe 75 basis points. It's keep going up and it's causing huge turmoil in the market, in the bond market, in the equity market. And... Uh, and it's causing huge trouble in virtually all um, market balance portfolios that we've seen over the course of the last six months. But then let's add some fuel to that fire. And we have got the Russia that has invaded the Ukraine. Uh, on top of that, it causes huge fears around fuel and food security, considering the amount of uh, food and fuel that, uh, that Russia and Ukraine supplies to the rest of the world. Um, this is now adding uh, to, the, to the problem that most people see. And the boogeyman from two years ago is not gone. Um, the Chinese have locked down pretty much uh, seven cities. Uh, New York, I believe, is now talking about creating new mandates again. COVID is not quite as behind us as we have, uh, have been led to believe. And so is it going to make a resurgence and are we going to see more lockdowns, um, another big talking point at the moment. And then finally, now everybody talks about a recession, um, inverse yield curves, uh, and uh, people are talking about a slowdown in, eco in economy. All of these things um, have converged around about the same time. And the investor is asking what other black swans are out there that could possibly hit us. Could it get worse? Um, so I think that is what we need to start about is before we talk about the opportunity, let's talk about the actual chaos that we're seeing and let's start talking about the war. Um, now, my colleague Mark um, is quite a student of war and has has been, he's British, they all are. And so, uh, so what he's done is he's sketched out a scenario for us and what is likely and what is severe and where will we likely end up? Um, well, we don't know, but he sketched out a 
from a peace uh, treaty right through to a nuclear bomb being dropped all over the world. He sketched out some ideas for us, and then we can maybe refer to Rob as, uh, as, our, as, as our American expert, because they're also all war experts, um, to, to maybe get his insight on what he thinks is a likely scenario. So Mark, over to you. Thanks, Lauren. So, yeah, what we've got here, ladies and gentlemen, is a Laffer curve uh, with most of the scenarios represented on them. Um, so uh, up the axes on the left, you see likelihood. So what you see is most likely at the top and least likely at the bottom. And then from a severity from left to right. So first scenario, bottom left, not likely, not very severe, uh, would be Putin calling it a day and basically withdrawing from Ukraine. I think uh, they're too far into it now for that to be a realistic scenario. Um, as we go up the Laffer curve, we see one of the sort of outlying scenarios, which is um, Putin being perhaps uh, replaced, sort of assassinated from the inside. Maybe the uh, the sanctions have bitten so much that uh, the oligarchs take action. Um, we'll be interested to see if that ever does play out. Um, I'm just going to skip over to the scenario in the centre. I think this is Putin's objective from the beginning uh, was a puppet regime uh, in Ukraine. Um, and actually, that is falling in likelihood the longer that this uh, conflict goes on. So what we have up the top are the three sort of most likely scenarios. Um, so the first one is some kind of drawn out, long winded conflict, maybe a military stalemate. Um, and then the other two scenarios are maybe an east west uh, Ukraine, like an east west Germany. Uh, split of, of World War II, um, or some kind of, of deal around you know, Ukraine potentially joining uh, the EU, but not NATO, and, and maybe a blend of those scenarios uh, is, is currently you know, what the most likely situations uh, appears to be. The time frame isn't clear, though. You know, this could all be done and dusted in a few weeks. It could still be going on for months and, and years into the future. But that's not really what everyone's worried about. Where we get worried really is as we come down the right-hand shoulder, so it's becoming less and less likely, but more and more severe. And the first scenario is a, an outright conflict between uh, NATO and Russia. Um, so in that scenario, we are in a global war. There's no two ways about it. That is the World War Three scenario. And it will probably come about as a result of maybe a, a, a misjudged missile or a, a mistake, you know, um, or maybe... Putin does actively put boots into the Estonian forest. We don't know. Um, linked on from that then is World War Three plus. Um, so China is then um, drawn in. Maybe they invade Taiwan. You know all those kind of worst case scenarios. Again, not very likely. They, they've actually been quite um, peaceful in their in their rhetoric thus far. But we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, and the last one, the you know, least likely and most severe, is outright nuclear war. Um, you know, I think it, we have to be aware that that could happen. Um, but at this moment in time, I'd like to think that uh, common sense uh, will prevail. So uh, with that as our backdrop and the scenarios that are there, obviously, we need to then sort of thread that into markets. And that's where I'd like to introduce Rob. Rob, uh, this is a, an interesting slide that shows us what's happening with the S&P 500. Um, what's your kind of take on things? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mark. And thanks, Lawrence. Um, you know, the, the, the shoulder scenarios to the right that, that you put up um, uh, where NATO gets drawn into the conflict or where there's uh, some form of, of nuclear conflict are almost unthinkable from, um, say, an economic or market perspective, because that, that truly is a, a black swan. And no one really knows the implications of that other than they would be uh, very, uh, extremely severe. So it really gets back to the, the more likely base case that you outlined, which is that the conflict um, continues to drag on. And you know, whether that's a stalemate of backwards and forwards successes by the Russians and then by the Ukrainians, and that it drags on for, for months and months, that's sort of the, the, the base case. And really the only one that you can um, sort of talk about realistic uh, scenarios as it relates to the, the market on. And I guess I'd, um, not, not to be tongue in cheek, because the, the, the human um, consequences of this uh, you know, really defy uh, description uh, as to what's going on. But from a, from a market perspective, um, I guess the analogy I would, I would draw, or the expression I would draw is from the movie um, Jurassic Park, which probably most of you have seen, and, and, uh, and I'm sure many of, our, many of our listeners have seen. There's a very famous line in there by the actor Jeff Goldblum, um, who said, nature finds a way. And the markets and the economy, more specifically starting with the economy, 
finds a way as well. Um, you guys uh, referenced um, the, uh, the, the consequences as it relates to energy and the disruption of the flow of oil and natural gas, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as grain, you know, wheat, soybean, uh, sunflower, uh, Ukraine and Russia combined, I think, are 30% of, of uh, wheat production. Ukraine is roughly 10%. 10%. Um, I think Ukraine is something like 100% of sunflower production. Um, so, you know, th those numbers are quite striking. So do we have a food crisis in, in, in the making? And information that I've seen starting with, with food tells us that um, there is enough production of wheat-based, soy-based products around the world um, that we can do without Ukrainian and Soviet, uh, Soviet Russian. Uh, that was a slip of the tongue there, I guess, right? Soviet of Russian production. Um, it's a matter of dollars to move it around. And I saw a United Nations figure this morning that said it would take about $18 billion worth of aid to get various uh, foodstuffs, grain, uh, basic grain stuffs, um, to the countries that will, would otherwise suffer because of disruption uh, in Ukrainian production and, and, uh, and Russian production. And while $18 billion sounds like an enormous sum of money, and, and it is, um, US, US Congress approved yesterday a $40 billion aid package to Ukraine uh, for arms and, and, and related, uh, related support. Um, so uh, if the UN does need to get its act together, if this does drag on, then the, a, a food crisis can be averted. It's simply a matter, simply a matter of raising, raising funds. Um, there's already significant activity underway as it relates to dealing with uh, the, the energy crisis in terms of, of shipment of, of uh, gas and oil and pipelines being disrupted, um, where uh, the US can, can and, and is increasing output. Um, there's ongoing discussions with OPEC. There's discussion of lifting um, sanctions around Iran for them to increase uh, production and shipments. So ultimately, um, the markets, uh, and most importantly, the economy, as this drags on, will find a way around um, what's happening in Ukraine. That doesn't minimize, of course, the, um, you know, the human tragedy that's underway, but um, the economy and then the markets to follow will, find, will ultimately find a way around, around this, uh, this conflict. Again, assuming the base case, if we get back to your shoulder scenarios of a NATO conflict or a nuclear conflict, almost imponderable um, at this juncture in terms of what that would mean to the, the economy and markets. And I think this next slide sort of sums that up. We, we kind of feel like it's an agonizing market. I'm sure there's a lot of clients and, and prospects of various people that are listening to this uh, discussion today and they're thinking to themselves, well, you know, it's, it's an agonizing market. Lawrence, can I bring you in at this point just to sort of tell me and, and the, those that are listening, you know, what do you feel is an agonizing market? Why? Well, the word agonizing is probably the best description um, because it is, it's very sore when a market falls, whether it's your own money, whether it's a client's money, uh, it's, it's, it's not nice to see. Um, but, uh, but the agony is more perpetuated by what you see in front of you now is the news media. Um, and I, when I sat with Rob the last time when we talked about the, the media, and, and I'll bring Rob in very shortly, um, it, it always talks about the, the today. Uh, you know, what, what do we see today in, in the news? And today, the, the, the market looks agonizing. When you look at it over time, it doesn't look agonizing at all. In fact, uh, we've got a slide sh um, um, sh shortly after this. Now, if we look at, for example, the S&P 500, we are now officially in bear territory. Um, so if you look at S&P just literally one year ago from today, you can see that it was trading at 4,200, today 4,120. So officially, we are in a bear market, but definitely in one in the NASDAQ and many other indices. So it looks like it's a, a huge agony. For the investors that came in late last year, sort of October, November, for them, it's even worse because for them, they see an enormous drop from 4,700, near 4,800, all the way to 4,100. And those news channels say that, it's, that it could go further. Um, but uh, if we look at history, it doesn't always look like this. But uh, certainly, um, Rob, if I can bring you in and we talk about that, that, the scenario that we sketched out together about what the news talks about today and doesn't account for tomorrow, 
you want to just sort of chime in there and and and, and discuss this with us? Yeah, I think because I think history is history is extremely important um, because history is a guide, right? History is a, I mean that's why history is such an important topic in, uh, in in school at all levels, because history is an important guide. It, if it's studied properly, it can predict uh, the future. And if you look at the history of the markets, um, you know, the, the, to, your, to your comment, Lawrence, the, the, the news media operates in a 24 hour news cycle now. Um, and they wanna grab people's attention. And the way that they grab people's intention, attention and investors' attention is by printing um, headlines and throwing out data and shocking you and alarming you because that's what that's what keeps you listening and watching, um, and frankly, that's what you know that's what attracts advertisers. So that's what the news media is about. Not, not to disparage them, they you know they provide important information, but they're moments at a time because they have to fill that that twenty four hour news cycle. Um, hopefully, none of us are investing on on a 24 hour basis we're investing for the for the long term right we, we have um, far off uh, objectives uh, for our investment portfolio based on on life goals so we measure success um, over years um, and, and as long as decades and if you look at history and you ask yourself you know is this time different I think if you look at the various decades, and I, I'm not going to go back to say that the 1930s, um, when none of us are around, but really look to sort of more recent history that certainly that, that I lived through, and I'm sure many, many folks listening to this call have lived through, I'll start with this, the 70s. And in fact, uh, there are a lot of parallels that are being uh, drawn uh, between what we're going through right now and what happened um, over the the, uh, the the decade of the of the 70s, and I'll talk about the 80s and 90s and present as well. But starting with the 70s, you think about what was going on um, then. We had um, the Arab-Israeli conflict, so war in the in the Middle East. Um, the Vietnam War was still raging on, well, you know, well into the middle of the 70s. Uh, you had the the Nixon Watergate scandal, which brought down the U.S. presidency. Uh, you had the oil embargo um, with the, the OPEC countries. Uh, for those of you who have been around as long as I have, I remember sitting in my parents' car as a kid, um, waiting in line uh, for over, you know, for hours at a time uh, on our, our what, whether our day was odd or even based on the number on our license plate to get, um, to get gas. Um, you had the uh, recession in 73 and 74, uh, so a significant market pullback then. Uh, and, and interest rates were approaching 20%. So we talk about where interest rates are now. Imagine 20%, where that's when I really wish that I, I had the funds back then to buy a 30 year, 30 year US treasury. Um, so with all that going on, by the end of the 70s, the market was positive, right? That, based on the, the news flow that I just, real events, real tragedies, um, as you compare them to what's happening today, not to diminish at all what's happening today, um, you had a lot of things going on in the 70s with a market that still finished the decade up uh, approximately 5%. And that set the stage for the 80s, which saw a re market return of almost 300%. And, and I recall in 1983, I was a senior in college. So getting ready to enter the, the job market, and unemployment was 10% in the US, right? It's at three and a half percent today. We have full employment in the US. Uh, and it, so you saw incredible returns during the 1980s. So then that ushered in the 1990s. And you'll have to bear with me again on the history lesson, but this is important. The 1990s started uh, with, a, with another recession, uh, July 1990 through March of 1991. So a brief recession. But then that was followed by one of the best equity market decades in our history with returns of 417%. Okay, now let's move into the 2000s. And that's more recent history. And we're all familiar, I think, with what happened during the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. Leading up to that, we had a great market. And then, um, then the financial crisis due to over leverage in the economy occurred. And the S&P 500 index, the broad market, fell 57% in 17 months, right? So that's a breathtaking kind of hold your breath kind of number. So when that 
when we hit the low in the first week of March that year, so let's take the, the first week of March that, that year to recent, a recent time, the first week of May, we just concluded last week, the market is up over 500% from that, that time period. So throughout that period, uh, throughout those decades that I just ran through, all kinds of tumult and chaos, you know, very appropriate name for the, the session this morning. There's been no shortage of chaos over the, over the, the, the decades, uh, recession after recession, but yet year, decade after decade of return where in, investors um, didn't just see modest returns, but saw their portfolios increase by fold after fold after fold. And this is what happens. This is what happens in, in markets. You, in, in, you go through economic cycles, you go through market cycles, and if you persevere through each of these cycles, it's an opportunity to make, um, to make a lot of money. And you can't time these cycles either. You can't time when these periods take place. I think you're gonna show some interesting data as to when, when returns um, happen over discrete, uh, discrete, periods of, uh, discrete periods of time. Um, I'll make one, one final point on, on history. Uh, right now, there is certainly plenty of bearish sentiment, uh, and rightfully so, based on the slides that you that you put up. Bearish sentiment on the market, and today we're looking at bearish sentiment of around sixty percent. And the last time we were at that low uh, or that high sentiment in the marketplace was March fifth of two thousand nine, just before we started the uh, the bull market that gave us the five hundred percent return through the first week of May. And, I, and I'm not saying that, I'm not calling a bottom now on the market, but certainly uh, a contrarian perspective is a healthy perspective and it's one that, that usually pays off in the market. So th that's a sort of a quick history lesson. The question of this time, is it different? Uh, as you look back to history, I'd say probably not. Excellent, thanks Rob and as always, Amazing, amazing insight there. Um, so, Lawrence, we've got a slide up here now showing different asset classes. What, what's this all about? What's this mean? Well, for, certainly in the last decade, me personally, I've not seen this much uncorrelated, um, uh, uncorrelated risk. And what I mean by that is normally, if you're going to be in equities and that comes down, bonds are going to hold up for you. If you're going to, if you know, if, if if you're going to be in commodities, then then something else holds up. If that comes down, I remember, like uh, invested in a in a um, uh, in a commodities fund. I think it was around about 2011 or 2012, and it seemed like it was the golden fund, and literally it 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 it, it ceased by about 80 percent. But then equities sort of held up, and bonds held up. So as long as you were diverse, then you know you were okay. Um, but today not even cash seems to be a safe bet because if cash is inflating at, at 8%, we're guaranteed to lose 8% a year on our cash. Our, our equities have fallen by 20, 30, 40, 50%. Uh, bonds have fallen by even treasury bonds, uh, as I spoke to Bob, has fallen. Um, and commodities have gone through a spike, but that was also now probably at an all-time high and it's extremely volatile. And really, um, the, the big question is where do you go where it feels safe? And currently, it doesn't feel safe for anybody. And, uh, and, and, and Mark, you very rightly said, this is probably the reason why, is because there's so many attacks. It looks like a, uh, like a messy dartboard, and everybody just chucked many things at it. So, um, so Rob, I'd probably just, just uh, ask if my, if, if my realization is true. Is, is, it, is it a huge amount of uncorrelated risk all culminating at one point or am I have I got it wrong no I think I think you've got it right and and if you think through the, the various periods that I just ran through um, there's always lots of uncorrelated risks out there and and for those who are who are listening who are still trying to think through you know what is what does this concept of correlation and uncorrelation mean to put it in in sort of simple terms it's when um, your, your spouse your boss, your kids and your neighbor are all um, fighting with you at the same time. And you're, you're trying to figure out how do I balance what everybody's throwing, throwing at me? Um, where are there opportunities to find, um, to find peace? You know, which battles do I need to fight, if you will? And, and I think that's sort of the, the question you're, you're posing as to what, you know, what do you do with all these, with all these uncorrelated risks? 
I think first stepping back to the the history that I uh, that I just covered, the important punchline of the of the history is that over over time, if you stick with a portfolio that your advisor has helped you engineer that's based upon your financial goals, and you as much as possible ignore ignore the noise, um, then things are going to be just fine in the end. You'll you'll achieve your your goals and objectives because you're going to stick to the 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 objectives based portfolio that that your investment advisor helped helped you engineer. That said, um, you're going to you're going to work with your advisor to tweak that portfolio as opportunities arise or as risks are created in the marketplace. And that's how I look at, at correlation. Um, it's really an understanding of what are the, the different forces at play, what's affecting the equity market, what's affecting the bond market, what's affecting um, other less correlated asset classes like, like property or infrastructure or precious metals. And you're gonna say, are there opportunities to tweak my portfolio? along the way or protect my portfolio, uh, investment portfolio along the way based upon uh, based upon these risks. And we, we can talk about, um, Mark and Lawrence, the different asset classes as we go along with the discussion today as to, you know, are there opportunities in bonds? Are there opportunities in infrastructure? What do we think of the equity market based on different uh, different scenarios? And those are the, the sort of those are the, the tweaks that we can that we can, if you will, play with in, 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 in our portfolios. Um, but by and large, you know, we're, we're, we need to stick to our um, stick to our objectives and our goals based portfolio and then address these um, risks and opportunities that come along the way as we deal with with these sort of uncorrelated events that present those um, those both those risks and opportunities. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. And uh, I think this sort of final slide on this section sums it up. I mean, it looks, looks pretty terrible. I'd even go as far as saying it looks a bit cack out there. Um, Lawrence, what would you say? I mean, what's, what's your, your view and, and, and you know, where, where are we in that sort of crisis mode at the moment? Yeah, I think, I think if you look at what investor sentiment is like, um, if, you, if you, like me, have many clients across different continents, of different walks of life, some very experienced investors, some not experienced at all, right from the experienced investor through to the unexperienced, right from the most calm investor through to the to the more anxious investor, they're all, um, they've all been highlighting this year how this is hurting. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult thing for an advisor to stand your ground on what you've built um, if, if, if it's down 20% or it's down 25 Now, imagine we, we hit 2008 levels and it's down 55 But, of course, if you look at it a decade later, you know, it's, you know those, those, those assets have, have 3x, 4x, 5x um, since that, that, that bottom. So, um, the, the, whilst the story looks bleak at the moment, it never continues. And when we get to the further slides, that, that will be um, that'll be the first one to talk about. I think the next one that's coming up is the, probably the biggest one to talk about, which is the bull market and the bear market. And uh, for those who don't know why it's called a bull market and a bear market, because not many people know, but um, if you look at how a bull attacks, uh, especially the matador, you will always see the horn going down to the floor and then it comes up. So it attacks up, always up. So that's why a bull market comes from the bottom and it goes on the way up. And if you look at a bear, how a bear attacks, it comes from the from the top and it goes down to the bottom. This is why they're called bull and bear markets. I have a set of bull and bear cufflinks that are always fighting. Um, but the interesting thing about bull and bear markets is that bull markets will always outlast bear markets. Um, the average length of a bear market is 15 months. The average length of a bull market over time is seven years. So you just need to be in that market for time. And the slide that you see in front of you, look at all the geopolitical events that, you, that you've seen. Look at the Cuban Missile Crisis. Look at the Vietnam War. Look at the oil shock. Look at the Iran-Iraq War. Look at the fall of Berlin War. Look at the Gulf War. Um, look at the Iraq War. 
Um, the only big red one that we see here, the big red one, um, six months later uh, is uh, when Russia invaded uh, Georgia. Let's be honest, that was 2008. It's got nothing to do with Russia invading Georgia. Um, it's got everything to do with a global financial crisis of, of, of um, credit default, and it's got nothing to do with, 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 war, with war. But the key thing is, if you look at that six month later mark on the, on, on the right hand side, you will see that the, the bulls nine out of 10 times always win. It is always a bull market later. In fact, had this bull been a more bear market than bull market, we would not have a stock market because no one would invest any money. And so, yes, it's, 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 a, it's a tough thing out there, but you just have to wait it out. And you can see that history through from the 60s, even from the 40s since Pearl Harbor, this, 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 this thing is unchanged. It's always a positive market here. This is just six months. When you look at it a year later, they're all blue, um, with the exception again of uh, 2008. You have to wait two years there. But uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it, yes, yes, it's, yes, it's crap um, at the moment. But it is just to hang in there, and uh, and will and will will survive. Um, Rob, your your thoughts on on my gibberish? Yeah, no, it's it's not gibberish. It's 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 spot on, and I think it it really gets to um, why is it so so important that the U.S. Fed does its job right now? Because there's a lot of folks who would say. Why does the, I mean, why does the Fed need to get involved at this juncture? They've let things go on as, as they have. I, I can, you know, when, when we talk about um, economic strength of the U.S., I'll quote a bunch of uh, statistics. The U.S. Is, is in an incredible position of strength economically at, at the moment. Um, so you'd say, well, do we really need to tackle inflation? Does the Fed really need to start raising rates? Because if the economy is, is strong and we've got all these negative events going on in the world right now, why don't we just let the market and the economy continue to, to do its thing? And I think what's important about the numbers that you put up is that throughout each of those periods, we had, an, we had economies that found themselves after going through brief recessions on solid paths. And that's not, that's not an accident. Um, there's a lot of central government intervention, not just the US Fed, but central governments globally um, that get involved with, yes, ad admittedly blunt instruments, you know, using interest rates to keep economies on a solid path. Um, because if you let inflation run, and certain countries do that. I mean, you look what's happened to, to South America over the decades, and you know you hear about inflation rates in the hundreds of percents. Or you look look at what's happening uh, in Turkey right now as they try and keep interest rates low, and the massive inflation that they're experiencing, and how that's ruinous to the economy. Is that's the goal of the U.S. Fed right now? Uh, inflation, uh, excuse me, recessions, as you've noted, are typically brief. And yes, they can be painful, uh, especially if you're on the on the wrong end of losing a job, um, and and you know other con other financial consequences to your portfolio. But they are generally brief, and the expansions are long, and so that's the game that the Fed has to has to play right now, or the endeavor that's in, that's in front of us is killing the the corrosive cancer that inflation can be, that can ruin economies over extended periods of time. Um, and if that involves, if that invokes a recession because of the extent to which they need to raise interest rates, so be it. That will be painful, but it will also be the pause that refreshes, that gets us back to, as you pointed out in your data, long-term sustainable economic growth um, that rewards not just the economy, but the markets as well. So the goal right now is to, is to, uh, for the Fed to, dampen inflation, which means dampening demand. It may push us um, into a recession, but that would be the pause that refreshes to get us back to the kind of expansions um, that you just you just put forth in your data. So an interesting slide that Mark is, going, is about to share um, is just something that came off of a train journey with him. Um, and I'll, I'll, not, uh, I'll not say too much, but with, with, with Rob saying that we're kind of where we are in terms of sentiment where we were in 2009, I think this slide is, is even more powerful. Um, Mark, do you just want to tell us about this? 
Yeah, I think this is a great indicator. This is a, a, a sentiment point here, and I'd be interested to get Rob's view on it. So, so CNBC, one of the big um, TV uh, cable companies in, in the US, you know, um, and they have a, a, a markets in turmoil um, special. Um, and I'm not saying that this is a bottom indicator, far from it. I'm, I'm interested to hear Rob's view on it, but they also have a presenter called Jim Cramer who comes in for a lot of stick around, you know, what you should and shouldn't be buying. But, but interestingly, when you look at when they do their markets in turmoil specials, okay, um, and they've just done one on the 5th of May, that's why I'm, I'm raising this as a point, you know, a year later, every single situation they've done this over since the, you know, 2010, so it's you know, 12 years worth of data, markets have been positive from where they are when they do that special. So, you know, they're screaming that the sky is falling, it's, it's going to keep going worse, you know, or have you, but a year later, the clouds have parted and the sunshine's come out, the birds are singing, as it were. And actually, when you look at the average return a year later, it's 40% higher. Um, so, Rob, what's your view on that? How, you know, are CNBC right to be playing to people's fears from a sentiment perspective? What, what's your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so no, the, the data's right. It's, I guess the, the question would be, what's the starting point for the year, right? When does that year start? Um, and that depends upon really which outcome you see as it relates to um, what happens with the economy, how does the Fed do its job? Because it's interesting, as much as sentiment is at the 60% 60, 60 number, and as much as um, the broad market, the S&P 500 is down now roughly 16, 17%, things could get a little worse today. You know, as we saw uh, inflation numbers come out this morning are still running hot. You know, we had hoped for um, to see it see it peaking, but it's still running hot. But yet within all that, there hasn't been what, what um, to, use, to use some industry jargon, what we haven't seen is capitulation yet in the market, meaning investors are concerned, right? That's what that 60% number in, indicates. Uh, sentiment is, is poor, but they haven't given up the ghost. They haven't capitulated. They haven't started this mass selling that often happens at precisely the wrong time. In a, in a market turn. So we haven't seen that capitulation yet. And I think some of that is because investors are waiting to see which scenario do we end up with? Is it the soft landing scenario um, where you know, the Fed has to do its, do its thing with raising interest rates, uh, but the US and global economy is strong enough so that it can weather uh, that rise in, in rates and in which case we have what's called that a soft landing as opposed to a recession. If that's the case, then one would say, maybe we are near, near market lows, right? Maybe the sell-off that we've had so far in the market is enough. And then that year starting point could start you know, pretty soon, if not, if not now. The other scenario um, is that the Fed has to do a lot more um, than, uh, than engineer a soft landing and take us into say a mild recession, in which case the market has further to fall. Um, you know, anyone's guess as to how far that is, um, but that the market could see continued downside. And so that, that year starting point that you're referring to could be, um, could be further off. But regardless of whether we're there now or we're there in three months or six months or 12 months, um, the data bears out that the, 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 these cycles do hold and they do remain intact and that the opportunity will be there uh, when, we, when we start to find that bottom. The thing is, uh, you know, and I think Lauren's um, in, uh, implied this as well, we don't know where that is. And the idea of trying to time that is a, is a fool's game. And I'm sure you guys will talk, will talk more about that. Well, you can see on the slide in front of you about trying to time things just post the Great Depression. Um, and you can see what, what the S&P 500 looks like um, when you try and time it versus just leaving it alone. So um, if you look at the decade of the 1940s to the 50s, um, if you managed to time uh, it and took out the worst 10 days, you made 136%. But if you pulled out the best 10 days, um, you made negative 14. And I have never met the person who can time the 10 worst days and the 10 best days in a year. I've never met that person because that person, Warren Buffett included, does not exist. But if you just left it alone for that decade, you made 51%. And 
The following uh, 10 years, you made 293% and 54 and 8 and 328 and 3, 330. And then the, the one, what I call, one, one unfortunate decade is that you had a financial crash right at the start of the decade and sort of towards the end of the decade. And I think that is what, uh, and they were two big ones, by the way, the dot-com bubble crash and the financial crash. They were big market correctors. Um, so I think that was a bit of a, an anomaly uh, in the general scope. And then if you look at what 2010 brought after that, even if you just stayed in from 2001 to 2011, it would have been positive. So it was just literally from 2000 to 2010. And then, of course, from 2020, if you were an investor and you had been in, you were up 27% on the S&P 500. It's only unfortunate for the people who really uh, right now have been an investor from circa 2021, really. They're the only ones who felt any pain. Everybody else is still in positive territory. And I don't think that that story is going to remain uh, unchanged. Um, uh, Rob, your, your views on this? Yeah, I think it makes the, the, the point that while we talk um, in terms of decades as we look at history and you know the phenomenal returns that we've seen in the decades, you know, I'll just go back to some of the numbers that I threw up, 300% um, return during the decade, uh, decade of the 80s, is over 400% during the 90s, uh, over 500% post-financial crisis. Um, when, when it comes down to, well, when did these returns occur? over those 10 year periods. Uh, we all wish it was an even, you know, even return each month so we could say, now I'm ready to get in, but you can't do that. The returns happen over very brief, discrete periods, which cannot be timed. So um, it's amazingly easy um, during these extended periods of time to miss the fantastic returns that can result by being in the market. You, um, you've got to you've got to show up. Basically, you have to be there in order to get the get the returns. Um, no one's going to call you. There is no financial advisor on the planet, including as Lauren said, look, Warren Buffett, who's going to call you up and say, "Now is the time. Now is the day. Now is the week. Now is the month." It doesn't work that way. Uh, you have to be in in the market. And certainly, there are there are opportunities to to take along the way, as we talked about things like uncorrelated. Um, markets and asset classes and things, but you 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 really have to be fully invested at all times, and and that gets to the importance of things like and I'm sure your your financial advisor tells you, which is you need a cash cushion as well uh, for periods where you know during a recession, if you find yourself um, unemployed, um, uh, other you know uh, cash needs to take advantage of various op opportunities, but you always need that cash cushion. Because to, to dip into your long-term portfolio, to start using equities as a form of liquidity, you're going to miss out on the kind of results that, uh, that Lauren and Mark uh, uh, put up on the, uh, on, the, on the slide here. You can't predict it. You can't time it. Anybody who tells you they can, um, well, they're going to sell you a bridge as well. And I think if we, if we look at the slide in front of us, if you look at just the S&P 500, um, since since uh, since since we started tracking it, um, you know, back in the day, um, obviously it's, it's run much longer than this. But you can see these volatile moments, and you can see what the result is. So just the one prior to the current one was COVID nineteen, um, and you can see how short lived that was. Um, that was a thirty five percent market correction, as it goes. Um, uh, then the one before that was when the Fed unnecessarily, uh, I, I would imagine, or as, as surprisingly for some, just went and put up interest rates dramatically in 2018. Then if you look at 2015, this is when the China crisis came about and you've got the global financial crisis, you've got dot-com bubble and many things in between. But you can see the, the, the comment that Rob made was the market always finds a way, you know, nature finds a way. And uh, this is uh, this is the result of um, of, of of where we are um, as humanity and and the continuation of progress. Um, so uh, so yeah, I think I think this is uh, this is quite a uh, um, quite a great slide because if you look at the slide that just shows a year, it looks like for the last year we're down. If you look at six months, it looks like it's down severely. But anybody who needed cash 
um, uh, only should never have been exposed to a market uh, over the course of the last six months. But people who are looking to long-term invest, they have to be in this market. They cannot be out and they cannot climb the top and the bottom. But you can see over a stretch of time, the, the, the bulls will always outlast the bears. So um, I, I want to bring Rob in again on, on this slide because it talks about um, institutional mentality versus retail mentality. This is a, this is a very, very, um, very perfect slide, uh, in my opinion. And the reason why this is a perfect slide is what happens on Black Friday, okay? Um, on Black Friday, um, it is the best time in, in the US. Now, I, personally, I was in New York City uh, in 2009, I think, or 2010. On Black Friday, I was in that very store, Macy's, on a Black Friday sale, the day after Thanksgiving. And I went in there like a kid in a candy store. And I, I had to, I bought so much crap that I needed to buy an extra suitcase to take with me back to London. And I was still charged overweight on the extra suitcase on the way back. That's how much bargain basement goodies I picked up on that day. But when the stock market goes into a Black Friday or a Black Monday, Everybody, excuse the, excuse the term, but everybody shut their, shuts their pants. Um, and, and the question is, why on earth are investors not seeing it as the Macy's Black Friday? Rob, you want to talk a little bit about this uh, investor sentiment versus um, shopper sentiment? Yeah, but um, first, you know, a comment on your shopping, um, your shopping spree in New York. You know, it's funny. I, I have a friend who works... Uh, uh, senior position at, at Marriott, um, and uh, his <clears throat> he, he's responsible for the Marriott hotels in in New York, and he experiences um, folks like you all the, all the time. Where a chronic problem for them are folks leaving behind suitcases of clothes and things that they brought with them on their trip that they leave behind because they're buying the bargains that they find in you know on a, they're relatively cheap in New York based on whether it's currency values or whatnot. So they have basements with storage that are full of suit suitcases from foreign visitors who really left behind everything they brought with them to fill their, to fill new suitcases with, uh, with things that they purchased. Um, but yeah, it's a good comparison, a good analogy to the, to the market. Um, because re remember, um, it is, it, there's a reason it's called a market because it's full of buyers and sellers. So during times of of fear, um, there's always someone on the other side of that and his name is greed, right? Um, or it could be a her as well, I don't wanna discriminate. Um, so when that retail investor is full of fear during downturns like this, and they decide I've gotta to go to cash, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a loss, I'm gonna risk permanent impairment of my capital, meaning I'm gonna lock in that loss because I think things are gonna get worse, that the bottom's gonna fall out. That, and, and, they, and they sell those stocks. In order to sell those stocks, there has to be someone on the other side of the trade. There has to be someone to buy it. Um, and that someone on the other side of the trade is often an institutional investor, um, someone who sees, great, there's panic, there's, there's blood in the streets, there's fear. Uh, and it was it Warren Buffett who said, when, uh, when, when those who are fearful, it's time for others to be to be greedy, something uh, you know, paraphrasing. Um, and that's what many institutional in investors see during times like this is they're going to be retail investors and some institutional investors who panic as well and who sell when markets are, are low and markets are cheap and they're buyers because they're, uh, they're, they're getting a bargain. Um, and that's how, that's how the markets work. It moves from, um, you know, people look for, for opportunities to enter at periods of cheapness and in order to do that, there have to be those who panic, who sell at the uh, at, at the wrong time, who sell um, in downturns or near or near bottoms. Thank you, Rob. I'm just going to move on. And before we do, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be opening up polls shortly just to get your view, uh, gauge the sentiment, the room, as it were, as to what we think uh, is happening out there and how your feelings are. Launch those uh, shortly, uh, Lawrence. What, what's this slide about the fundamentals? Well, um, a comment uh, that came in on the Q&A, and by the way, please do send in the Q&As uh, to Mark along the way, but a comment um, that came in on the Q&A, uh, and I was waiting for that one, was uh, 
do we think that the markets will fall as much as 50% or plus like they did in 2008? And the reason why this fundamental slide comes up is what I want to quiz Rob on um, is, uh, is what do the fundamentals of the underlying holdings that you would have to put in a portfolio today, how does that differ to what, um, to what the fundamentals were um, just pre-financial crisis 2008? Uh, or 2000 for, the mat for that matter. Because I think fundamentally, this is just a personal thought, I think fundamentally things were broken in 2008 and I don't think they're broken now. Um, I, think they're, I think the fundamentals are, are absolutely excellent, but Rob, your thoughts? Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point, Lawrence, because that gets into, the, into um, how the Fed will, will act as it relates to raising interest rates as well. Um, because you know, to your point, it wasn't just the markets that were declining during the financial crisis, but in fact, it was a true financial crisis and there were concerns about the viability of the financial system. And that's why you saw major banks, you know, Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch being uh, either, uh, or Lehman Brothers going out of business or being bought by other financial institutions. You had, a, you had a near collapse of the financial system, not just the markets. You don't have that today. Um, in fact, you have, um, uh, financial institutions like banks and, and, and brokerage firms that are in very strong positions with very strong balance sheets. You have companies that have very strong balance sheets, plenty of cash and liquidity on hand, and the consumer is in excellent shape, um, uh, not over leveraged the way they were uh, pre and during the uh, during the, the financial crisis. So it's a it's a very different climate right now, which is why when when uh, I'm asked the question about well, will the Fed keep, keep its foot to the gas on raising rates, um, uh, even as the market falls? You know, is the Fed that heartless that they're not going to worry about the, the market? And in fact, what the Fed, the Fed doesn't worry about the market, the US Fed does not worry about the market. And if the market is down 10 or 20 or 30 or 40%, what they worry about is, is the financial system stable. And right now the Fed looks at the, not just the US financial system because it has a global responsibility in some respects, but looks at the, the global financial system and says, not only is it intact, but it's strong. So if that means that the, we take it on the chin during, um, uh, as, as we raise rates and, and, and conquer inflation, and that creates a downturn in the equity market or even uh, a mild recession, that's worth the price of, of conquering inflation and, and giving us a, a strong economy uh, and, and the pause that refreshes that'll send us back onto another period of economic strength and rising markets. Cheers, Rob. And uh, Lawrence, I think this is quite an interesting slide. We, again, talking about that train journey, we were chatting about the, uh, the, the ladies and the lipstick. I think that's a, a lovely story. Tell, me, tell us more about that. Well, yeah, uh, like people always um, ask, you know, if, 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 if markets come down, you know, are there opportunities? Uh, obviously, it was the title of the, the webinar today. So if you look at the company on the top left there, Estate Auto, which is one of the largest makeup producers on earth, um, just a couple of facts. Firstly, during the First World War and Second World War, the only industry that took no knock the only retail industry that took no knock was the makeup industry. Women would walk out of the house in, in the Second World War still with the same amount of red lipstick on as they did always before. But if you look at this company and if you look at its adjacent uh, companies and the ones underneath them, um, the, the opportunity inside businesses like this, now they've all sold off. They're all down 20, 30%. Um, they're all down 20, 30% on, on, on things like um, interest rate fears, and these companies all fund their businesses through cash. They, they, they are not depending on borrowing from a bank. They are not credit dependent at all. They all fund their businesses through cash. Microsoft, Nike, Amazon, and many, many others that we invest in. So should, should, should interest rates worry them? No, if anything, it means their cash returns more money. Um, and, and 
And, and a bigger thing is, well, should they worry about inflation? Well, all of these companies have got an enormous amount of gross margin, so they could swallow some of the inflation. But key thing is they don't need to because they can pass their cost on to the consumer. If you look at Microsoft, for example, Microsoft can say, look, our services are just 7% more expensive this year. If you don't like it, you can shelve it, but it's too integrated inside of the um, of, of, of the company's um, uh, underlying technology that they cannot just shelter. If someone is uh, taking Amazon Web Services, they are taking Amazon Web Services. If someone is loyal to, to a brand like Estee Lauder or Nike, they're not going to switch. Like, heaven offend a woman switches to a cheaper makeup brand um, because times are tough. That is just not going to happen. Um, so, so these are the types of businesses that we see as excellent opportunities. Now, not just these ones. I mean, there are many like them. But all of this fear mongering that we see on the news channels around interest rates and inflation and, and, and recession, you know, some, some companies are robust against all three. And the question is just what are we doing to, uh, uh, to educate our clients to make sure that they are investing in these types of things. And, and, and this, this, this is Rob's slide that's coming up here. And the reason why this slide is, is, uh, is, is pertinent is because the sell-off that we've seen is predominantly going from what we would call the previous good stocks into what I think is, is, is absolutely awful cyclical stocks. Um, and it's provided a source of funds to these stocks. Um, and, and Rob, can you just sort of talk, talk us through this old economy, new economy story uh, and, uh, and, and why we can't look uh, back um, towards the future, you know, with our backs towards the future in terms of what we invest in and, and what really is going to change the world in the next 10 years? Yeah, that's, that's so important, Lawrence, because um, um, the... I mean, the, the companies, certainly the, the cyclical companies, and when we use that term, we talk about companies that um, respond to uh, business cycles, uh, supply and demand. We're seeing right now, that's the, the um, in particular energy and materials, you know, the oil companies and, and some of the financial institutions. And, and they're, they're doing well now um, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is because there is a there's a shortage of, of these resources, and that's why we're seeing energy prices go up. There are supply issues, and there's very strong demand. That will all change very quickly if the economy uh, truly does start to slow. And, and goodness, if we go into a recession, you're going to see um, oil prices plunge. Um, you're going to see interest rates start to come back down and banks lose the spread income that they've been appreciating off of recently. So these, these cyclical stocks, as the, name, as the name denotes, will go through these cycles um, that are solely based on this sort of um, supply and demand, de demand and interest rate dynamic. Whereas the, what as Lawrence termed them, the new economy companies are much more perennial uh, in terms of their strength uh, their ability to grow, their ability to um, provide products and services that consumers want, um, because they're they're uh, they're forward-looking companies that are solving um, the um, the world's problems. So whether it's through technology, um, whether it's um, healthcare, um, biotech, um, you're hearing more and more about um, green energy solutions and infrastructure. Um, the kind of companies that we saw do so well during the, uh, the COVID recovery, e-commerce companies, the whole uh, phenomenon of, of um, work from home, shop from home, uh, entertain from home. These are all companies that are um, doing things for the economy and the consumer and institutions and world problems and solving world problems that are the real uh, sustainable growth stories. And with the sustainable growth story, you're generating sustainable and growing earnings and sustainable and growing, and growing earnings are the engine of the stock market. So those are the, the, the kinds of companies and industries that have real legs to them. And that's what you want, frankly, in the majority of your portfolio. And increasingly, as you look at the market indices, um, they're predominantly populated with these types of, of, of companies. Um, certainly their prices have come off and they've come off severely recently. 
um, because these prices were, were elevated really uh, as a result of, I think, the, the, the COVID recovery. It's not that these companies have suddenly seen uh, um, market declines as a result of, of, of poor fundamentals. The fundamentals or the underpinnings of these companies are still exceptional. So this is really more of the pause that refreshes. The cyclicals that we're all chasing right now, energy, materials, and financials, and others, um, are really, in our opinion, sort of more short-term um, events or short-term phenomenons as a result of, of, of what we're experiencing right now with inflation and rise in interest rates. Um, but as you think about your portfolio, and as you look at the, um, the underlying funds that many of you own, and what kind of companies portfolio managers have populated these portfolios with, they're the new economy, uh, new economy companies that are in the technology space and the consumer space, um, and much less so in these uh, in these these uh, cyclical names that are that are more temporary phenomena in the market. Thanks for that, Rob. So, Lawrence, moving on, then uh, let's talk about bonds. What what bond, what bonds been doing? Well, um, I think for the first time in some time, there is an enormous amount of opportunity in, in the bond market. And I'm not talking to specifically about corporate bonds, I'm, I'm more referring to, my, to treasuries, gilts, etc. cetera. Um, and when, when we, myself and Rob talked the last time, I think he shared the sentiment. Uh, maybe if you wanted to dig a little bit deeper, um, uh, um, uh, Rob, in terms of why, why is the bond market becoming almost equally as exciting now as what the equity market is? Yeah, bonds are an interesting asset class because for, for a long, long time, we've, wanted to, we've all wanted to hold bonds in our portfolio but, uh, because bonds are supposed to be uncorrelated with equities. Uh, the challenge with bonds is that um, over this incredible economic expansion that we've had, one of the longest economic expansions that we've had in history, that was driven in large part um, by easy money. And that meant interest rates were very low. And so if you're a bondholder, you weren't earning much. You know, cash, you were earning zero. In some, in some cases, money market funds were, were delivering negative yields. Um, and you were seeing even longer dated government bonds functionally at, at zero. And certainly after in, inflation, you, you were losing money. So bonds weren't much of an investment. So now what we've seen uh, as inflation um, has, has, has risen to lofty levels, and central banks are trying to fight inflation, they're raising, raising rates. Now, the tough part of that in the meantime is that if you held bonds, um, interest uh, yield and the principal value or the price of your bond are, are work um, in what we call an inverse correlation, meaning when price come up, prices go up, bond prices go up, yields come down and vice versa. So now we're in this period of rising interest rates rising bond yields, and that means um, that, uh, that bond prices have been falling. Um, but the opportunity is purchasing new bonds, and as Lawrence indicated, uh, government bonds, you're starting to get decent yields again at cheap prices. So the, the opportunity is starting to emerge to take another look at, at the credit portion of your portfolio or the bond portion of your portfolio. And the reason that we make a distinction right now between government bonds and corporate bonds, as, as, as Lawrence just mentioned, uh, gets back to sort of uh, safety and, and credit quality that obviously with, with government backed bonds, um, you're getting um, a higher credit. Corporate bonds, will, there'll be an opportunity in the corporate bond space as well. But I think first there, we need to figure out what does happen to the economy. Uh, do, do, we, do, we, do we test uh, a mild or even a severe recession? If so, that could impact what we call credit spreads, meaning what happens to the, um, the spread between um, uh, investment grade bonds and government bonds and even lesser grade um, corporate bonds. Uh, are corporate bonds ris risky for the time being? At some point in the future, there will be an opportunity to buy corporate bonds with, with, with uh, attractive yields. But for the time being, if you're thinking about the bond market, you can get a, a, a real yield now uh, and you can get it with a government bond that's gonna give you the credit quality that, uh, 
that, that you need from a, from a safety standpoint. So good time to, to start to, to test that water. Maybe uh, from, an, uh, from a portfolio management perspective, you're seeing some folks are saying, I'm gonna sell the bonds that I own today that I've had for a while that, are, that have very low yields. Uh, maybe I'll take a loss on them, use that as a tax loss and reinvest that into um, new government bonds that have been issued at a higher yield. Great stuff. And, and Lawrence, probably worthwhile um, just touch, touching on some of the other asset classes that we get asked about, There's some questions that we've already had. Like, and we'll start to bring the questions in shortly, ladies and gentlemen. So yeah, things like small caps and, and, and other um, alternatives, what's your view there? So I'll, I'll bring Robin on the small caps just shortly because I know it's, a, it's an area of his expertise and also passion. But uh, the reason for the two boxes at the bottom is when you, when you construct portfolios, you cannot just be in, 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 in bonds and equities. That, that, you know, that, 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 that doesn't mean that you're in the wrong asset classes, but you can't just be there because there are opportunities elsewhere. Um, so uh, the reason for the Goldman one there is it's one of the providers of of things called structured products or promissory notes. And you have many of them. You've got UBS, you've got Morgan Stanley, you've got Investec, et cetera. Now, these are also interesting vehicles to, to pick up as there's so much volatility. And as there is an enormous amount of volatility in the market, what you see is you've got something called the volatility index. And that volatility index spikes. And when it, when it goes like this, it means that the coupons that you can pick up on these types of structured products are, are typically enhanced. And so you can pick up very attractive yields on, on, on these types of instruments. So that, that creates another opportunity. Outside of that, you have to be inside of the property market as well, the real estate market, whether it's holding physical assets, whether it's REITs, et cetera. These are other assets that are creating huge amounts of, um, uh, huge amounts of, uh, of, of interest, typically because of the rising cost of inflation. So property that I've bought, um, I signed the lease, well, not lease the, 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 the purchase order, I signed for at the back end of December. Um, the property prices now, um, and we're talking five months later, is already enhanced by 10% just because of that inflationary rise. So there's a 10% increase in my property and I have not yet owned it for a full year. Um, but the biggest story in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of, of, of opportunity, I think in terms of stock market, is where small cap stocks trade as a premium or as a discount towards the greater S&P 500. And, 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 and Rob, do you wanna chime in there and, 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 and tell us your thoughts? Yeah. Um, first, I, I you know like to comment in, on on your the alternative assets, the other assets that you just commented on. That that's a, a very important part of the portfolio of, of one's portfolio. The old sort of balance just between stocks and bonds, I think, is a, is a, a dated form of, of of allocating one's money in the, in their portfolio. You have to have that that other bucket, if you will, which includes assets like. Lawrence mentioned structured notes and real estate, uh, maybe some precious metals, um, infrastructure, uh, but to have that other bucket, because it's it's a good foil, if you will, against traditional bonds and, uh, and equities. So that, that's always an important portion of one's portfolio. But as we look at the equity market, as, as Lawrence mentioned, there are there are opportunities, not just in you know by industry, but by market cap as well. And uh, you know, I am a fan of of small cap stocks, small company stocks, generally with market caps of, of under uh, under five billion dollars in the in the marketplace. So these are sort of the smaller companies, small to mid sized companies, relative to the the mega caps that Lawrence had shown on a on a previous slide. You know, when you, when you look at some of those those companies that are in the S and P five hundred, we like to look at the other end of the size spectrum. And small caps have really taken it on the on the chin, um, and the and the reason for that relative to the broader market, you know, say the S and P, the broader market's down about 16, 17 percent, and small cap stocks are down roughly double that. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because um, the small cap indices are largely populated with growth stocks, and the growth stocks are some of the stocks that we've talked about that have um, declined the most. Um, in this in this economic cycle, those are the technology stocks, the new economy stocks. So, technology, biotech, healthcare, certain stocks in the consumer space, um, the real growth stories 
and their fundamentals are still very much intact. These are still great companies, um, uh, well-run businesses, generating strong earnings. Um, but because they were pricier coming into this coming into this latest downturn, they were hit the hardest from a uh, from a price standpoint. So now you essentially find them um, on sale relative to large cap stocks. Small cap stocks almost always in market history have traded at a premium on an earnings basis to large cap stocks, roughly a 3% premium. Now they're trading at anywhere from a 20 to 30% discount to large cap stocks. So if you look at your portfolio now and you say, um, gee, I don't have any exposure to small cap stocks, these new economy type companies, or I had an exposure to small cap stocks, but now that allocation is, is, uh, is down significantly just because of depreciation, this may be an interesting time to start legging in, do what we do call dollar cost averaging into small cap stocks. Because we're not, we're not pounding the table saying, um, this is it, this is the bottom, but um, they are cheap relative to other asset classes, certainly cheap relative to their larger cap uh, stock brethren. Uh, so an interesting time, both in terms of price, as well as the kinds of companies that are, uh, that are inside small cap stock funds to be, uh, to be taking a look at, uh, at that asset class. I think uh, finally, um, uh, this, this one is specifically talking about infrastructure, um, green, renewables, et cetera. And, um, and one of the fascinating things that the guys from VAM have, uh, have picked up on and I invested quite heavily is how do you invest in future technology, um, in, in future green energy, et cetera, but it's the equivalent of buying uh, things like government guarantee. So lastly, Rob, I'll, I'll go back to you on this one, but uh, tell us a little bit about the, the infrastructure fund that we, that we typically invest in. Why do we go in there and what, what are the sort of guarantees that a person has in there? And how is this long-term uncorrelated perhaps to the greater stock market? Yeah, I think, uh, Lawrence, to start with more broadly, um, you, know, you mentioned sort of the, just the importance of, of infrastructure um, and green infrastructure in, in particular. There's uh, tremendous demand for that. I mean, it's, it's, it's in the news headlines every, every day um, about um, climate change and, and um, climate mitigation and um, quality of life. And, uh, and, and what, are we, what are companies doing uh, to in, 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 uh, invest in that space and the new technologies that are emerging. And then you know, more directly, as we, as we, we, we go back to the, the, uh, the conflict um, with Ukraine and, and Russia, and we're seeing that um, energy is being used as a weapon globally, right? We're seeing what's happening with supply chains being cut off and are they going to deliver the gas? Are they going to deliver the oil? And at what price? Uh, and, and countries are realizing that they can't be held hostage uh, to energy because obviously it's such an important part of our economy. So you're seeing more local, and you're going to see dramatic increases in local development um, at a country level in energy resources. And in many cases, that has to be green energy because not everyone has the, the oil and gas and coal reserves in their country. So that means greater investment in local green energy. So whether it's wind power or solar power or hydroelectric, and you're gonna see a resurgence in, uh, in nuclear as well. And all of that, um, all those in the green energy category hap will happen on a, on a local level to pre prevent um, countries from being held hostage um, by traditional fossil fuels uh, that are concentrated in certain parts of the world and have to be shipped and, and, and there has to be um, uh, geopolitical peace in order for that to happen. So you're gonna see greater investment on a country level in green energy. And um, it's, private, it's private enterprise, private industry that creates these green energy solutions. And this is where um, uh, funds that invest in these types of, of opportunities um, stand to do extremely well over the, uh, the coming months and years as, as, the, as um, green, energy, uh, green energy takes on. And then of course, uh, while it, it's private enterprises that are uh, creating these, these, uh, these resources through their investment, it's governments that are often 
um, the investor in making sure that these projects in, in green energy and other infrastructure happen. And that's what Lawrence was referring to, where there's this sort of underlying um, government contract, this long-term government contract where, where local governments are investing in these projects and these green energy projects. Um, and that gives the investor some kind of, of, uh, of, of certainty. Well, there, there's certainly equity investments and we'll move up and down with the equity markets. The underlying contracts to make these projects, these investments in green energy happen, um, fall under a government, a long-term government contract that can't be broken. So um, there is a component of, of uh, not again, not guarantee, but uh, but certainty of uh, to these to these opportunities that end up in in these uh, in these fund portfolios. And Lauren's mentioned that BAM in particular has a, a fund that invests in these types of these types of projects. So it's another asset class that you should consider uh, for your portfolio. It's another uncorrelated asset class. It's a new economy type of investment and one that, that we believe has an important future, uh, future ahead of it. Excellent, thank you very much, Rob. Thank you, uh, Lauren. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for, for staying with us through the discussion so far. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, certainly the, the poll question seemed to see that. So uh, we're gonna give it another minute before we shut the poll and, and release the results. And we'll talk through that as part of uh, this sector, which is the, the Q&A aspect. So if you haven't already done so, uh, please ask a question below. You find it in the, the center of the, the menu bar there at the bottom, uh, Q&A button, and we'll try and get through as many questions there, but also uh, we've had some questions coming in via WhatsApp as well. Um, so let me just start off with this first question. Um, so from, uh, from one of the attendees today, um, Lawrence, maybe one for you, for you. What are the chances of a full 50% pullback in US markets? We need to dust off the, the crystal ball for that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I, personally, I can't see it because, I, again, I don't see the fundamental reason why it would sell off. I don't see a broken system. Um, I see, I, I honestly think it's sentimental. Um, uh, consumer confidence is, is still good and high. Companies' earnings are excellent. Um, so I don't, I don't see the market in a terrible place. So personally, um, I, I think this is, uh, you know, you know, there's a comment: the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Um, this doesn't, this punishment the market's taken doesn't look like it fits the, the, the apparent crime that it's committed. I think in 2008 it was justified, um, but it doesn't look like. I think this is just a healthy reorganization of an index. I think it is just. A healthy clear out and maybe it did go with the amount of enormous amount of money that was printed um you know, uh, a fortnight ago you know by the by the well, you know two years ago during COVID. um if you look at the enormous amount of injection of capital everything went up like this central banks take, took all the rates down i think it's just kind of corrected if you actually if you look at the tra trajectory line it just looks like it's kind of met that line so my, my personal view is that I don't think it falls to 50. Um, can it fall more? Sure. Um, is the S&P going to bottom out at 3,500? I don't know. 3,800? I don't know. But to be honest, I don't care. I just care about the underlying constituents that the person invests in and what their long-term trajectory is like. And I know that markets outlast good markets good markets outlast bad markets. And, and that's the, the, the honest um, view. Uh, Rob, I don't know if you have any different opinion. Yeah, I think you, the most important thing is what you've concluded with Lawrence, which is good, good, good markets out long, outlast bad markets. And um, it's, it's pure speculation as to where we'll end up. Um, you know, where's, where's the bottom over, over time, as we've shown with, with all the history and charts and data, it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, if you want to speculate on it, it's really going to come down to how hard does the Fed have to push uh, to kill inflation? Uh, you know, the Fed's got the double dynamic of dealing with not just slowing down demand, but dealing with the supply issue as well. And that's, what's, that's what the, the inflationary problem is. So, you know, right now, Fed funds are somewhere around, you know, between 75 and 100 basis points, um, you know, 0.75 and 1%, 1 percent. Um, you know, the expectation is that they need to, to be somewhere around two and a half, three to quell 
inflation. If that if that's sort of the limit of what they need to do, maybe a little higher, then you know you're nowhere near the kind of market decline of you know you're, you're down fifty percent. If for some reason inflation can't be killed um, by that more modest rise in, in Fed funds, and they need to be four or five plus percent or more in the in the short term interest rates, we call the Fed funds rate, um, then you're going to have increased downward pressure on the on the market. But um, but we don't see that. Um, we think that you know the, the numbers that we saw today is that while inflation is still high, it's peaking. And the Fed is very late in the cycle doing this. So I think by the time the Fed would get around to interest rates that could really kill an economy and really kill the markets, um, they're a little late in the game for that. I think the economy will, will start to, will start to uh, reach sort of more sustainable levels um, under its own weight as opposed uh, to needing the Fed to kill it. Excellent. Thank you very much for, for that response there. Rob, I'm just going to bring in the polls now and uh, share those with everyone. So we had nearly 100 uh, responses, which is uh, fantastic. Um, in hindsight, maybe we should have asked some of these questions at the beginning and see if it shifted along the way. Um, but I'll just run through them now and maybe we can discuss them as well. So do you think a year from now, the investment values will be higher, the same or lower? Well, the majority think higher. Um, so Hopefully that's a, a positive sign. Um, how have you reacted to the recent drawdown in your investment portfolio? I always say this to clients. There's always a handful of options that you can do. You can sell and turn everything into cash. You can sell a bit. You can hold on and do nothing. And 63% and of people are saying, actually, you know, we're going to stay calm. We're going to hold on and, and see uh, what's happening. And um, 31% of the people on the call are actually seeing this as a buying opportunity. Um, you know, and potentially, if everything that we're saying uh, comes to pass, then potentially this could be a, a once in a five to 10 year uh, opportunity, you know, once, uh, but that'll only become clear in hindsight, right? Um, what, what is your greatest concern currently? Um, over 58% uh, said the slow recovery of the market, um, and then 21% are equal between a a concern about the the Zara brand and a, a fear to deploy uh, further further funds, and then the last one, um, you know, it's just showing where people are currently invested. Uh, the majority uh, between uh, offshore developed markets at seventy percent, um, and about twenty eight percent locally within uh, the the JSC. Some some interesting stats there. Um, I'm just going to bring in a question on um, on WhatsApp here. So. And this one may be for the Lawrence and for Rob actually as well. The U.S. vote takes place in November this year. Well, what are you expecting to see as a, a result? Of how are U.S. markets likely to react? So, firstly, I've got no comment on U.S. politics. Um, and this is you know, while, while I love talking to, to 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 Rob, we we kind of sit on different sides of the uh, often sit on different sides of the uh, political spectrum. <laughs> But uh, Rob knows the American um, political landscape much better than I do, so I'll I'll seed this question. Yeah, so I'll and, and I'll show my colors here a little bit in terms of uh, I think unfortunately um, we're going to have a Republican um, win in right, right now we have a, a Democratic Senate and a Democratic Congress in the U.S. And I think you know Joe Biden is getting tarred with everything that's wrong going going wrong right now. Brush, um, in particular, in, an inflationary environment that he, frankly, inherited. Um, some of which he's trying to address right now through things like um, removing sanctions from China on imports to the U.S., which have been part of the challenging in, in, in increasing prices on certain goods and services. But that, that aside, um, with that blame comes um, um, voter sentiment. You know, we, we've talked some about investor sentiment. Now we'll talk about voter sentiment. Voter sentiment is you blame the guys that are in, that are in power for everything that's wrong. And that's probably gonna lead us to at least a takeover by Republican party in the um, House of Representatives and possibly the Senate as well. Okay, so how does that translate to the market? Well, we know the policy positions of Republicans. Um, they're very pro-free market uh, economy, very anti-tax. So the odds of any tax legislation coming through Congress are zero. Um, there, many of the uh, regulations that were put in place by the Trump or, or removed by the Trump administration and have now been reinstated by the Biden administration 
Um, if there is a Republican Congress, they'll do their best to eliminate many of those um, res restrictions, which are burdensome for businesses and cost businesses money and hurt and hurt earnings. So reduced regulation, um, um, no tax proposals in sight are a positive for business and therefore should be a, a positive signal for the, uh, for the economy and the markets. So uh, as someone who's a fiscal conservative but a social liberal, I think it's, it's, uh, it's ultimately a negative thing um, for, for the country and many of our friends around the world, but I think we're gonna be seeing a more Republican con controlled Congress, um, which uh, is a positive for the, uh, for the economy and the markets, certainly in the, in the, in the near term. Great, thank you, Robin. We'll take two last questions to try and stay within the, the hour and a half. Um, so I'm going to go with uh, a question here. Um, Connor, actually, could uh, there be a, a case for a US recession being a positive thing um, in the lead to deflation and potentially bring inflation rates close to interest rates without the Fed's input? I mean, I, I know we touched on the, on inflation, where that is so far, but uh, you know, is recession necessarily all bad? Um, so we, we've, we've seen the statistics that, that a, we prefer a slowdown, obviously, um, as, because sure. we, we need the pause that refreshes. And that means that inflation has to come down because inflation is the real, is the real cancer. Um, if we need a recession to kill inflation, um, then it can be the, you know, the, the, the distasteful medicine that we take. Um, I tend to, to, to side with, with Lawrence as I, you know, again, as we look at um, U.S. statistics, um, I mean, you've got unemployment in the U.S. of three and a half percent. You've got five million more jobs than there are el eligible job uh, applicants. Um, you know, the U.S. economy continues to be in a recovery stage from COVID, not in a pullback stage. So it's going to take the, a lot for the Fed to induce a recession. That said, if they do induce a mild recession, if that's the medicine that we need um, to create that pause that refreshes so we can move to another leg of expansion and, and growth in the economy and the resulting equity markets, uh, then so be it. But um, I think the jury's, the jury's out still on if a recession is, uh, in a Fed-induced recession is going to be necessary. It's certainly not in 2022, um, you know, recessions, the lag, um, that it takes for a recession to come into bear um, after employment starts to um, unemployment starts to rise is usually around 13 months. So I think if a recession is in the cards, a mild recession, we're still we're still a ways away from that. Excellent. Thank you, Rob. OK, I'm going to try and link two questions together because they are sort of closely uh, you know, uh, linked and that's in relation to commodities and OPEX role. Um, so obviously we've seen uh, oil from a historic low in the, the depths of the pandemic, you know, rising significantly, peaking, and it appears pulling back a little bit. Um, so two questions here. So, you know, is this the start of a commodities boom? Um, and then linked with that, you know, we've, we've mentioned sort of one of the solutions potentially to inflation that's in the ether, which is, you know, suddenly Iran or maybe even Venezuela coming in from the cold and, and being allowed to sort of, uh, quote, <laughs> ex-American presidents drill baby drill um, so Rob what's your what's your view on on commodities and, and potentially oil uh, coming from other newer sources and, and, and how OPEC might respond what's your view yeah I mean, you know I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm certainly not the expert in, in this matter but I you know my, my opinion is that OPEC has been playing an interesting game because um, they've kept a they've kept a tight rein on on high prices um, you know, this it was there's an opportunity then for uh, to, for them to play sort of a more friendly political ball, if you will, um, and they haven't they haven't gone that that route. They they've kept a tight uh, tight rein on on high prices, um, where that could come back to haunt them as well as the other other oil producers, is if the economy truly does start to slow, and then demand slows, um, and then and we'll see energy prices come come back down. So. Um, as we talked about earlier in the discussion, um, energy and commodities are cyclicals. Um, right now, there is, uh, there's a shortage. There's a shortage brought on by war. There's a shortage because of the, the, the supply chain issues that we, that we have. But ultimately, as that's worked through, you're going to see energy and commodity prices uh, 
uh, come down. There are certain commodities like rare earth minerals um, that are interesting investment plays because of the what's happening in areas like uh, the electric car market um, and those those rare earth um, minerals are you know are desperately needed and in short supply um, for evolving technologies. But basic um, commodities like fossil fuels are are seeing their day in the sun right now. No pun intended. Um, but they will suffer um, as the economy uh, as the economy resets. Okay, Lawrence, any final thoughts there uh, before we wrap up? Well, just 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 one, and I just wanted to uh, throw this at at, at, at Rob. Um, uh, at what point can interest rates go up before America defaults on its debt? At what point can interest rates go before America defaults on its debt? Boy, um, I mean, that's where the screen just goes black, doesn't it? I, I imagine if, if let, 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 so, so the, the reason I'm asking the question, right? So let's let's say let's say inflation stays at eight percent, and then and 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 uh, and the Federal Reserve wants to put its rates up all the way to eight percent. Can America afford? all its debt at that point. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly America will, uh, I mean, when you think about what it'll have to do to support higher debt levels and increases taxes, it finds other sources of revenue. Um, but the, the notion that, um, that there is a, uh, a number out there that America defaults on its debt, it'll just keep printing money. Um, and that's the, I'm not saying that's the right solution, but ultimately that's the solution to um, higher interest rates and default risk is you just keep, keep printing greenbacks and it creates massive inflation, rise in interest rates and the necessity to tax the population further. Um, and we could see worse than recession, but that's how you prevent, that's how you prevent default. Um, you just keep printing currency. And uh, there seems to be no shortage of that over, over time. I think 40% of all dollars have been printed in the last like two, two years or three years or four years. Is this not a big story? Is this not a big worry? Or are you not concerned about this? Oh, well, there's always concern about it. I mean, that's why we have this... Um, this, um, this balance sheet problem in the US, that's why we have this deficit problem in the US is that the attitude is you can just keep printing money. I mean, the, the US Congress goes through this every year where it has a, uh, this concept of a budget ceiling that is really a joke because the ceiling just gets raised every, every year. Uh, we just say, we'll print a little more, we'll print a little more. And this does become a problem for uh, I put this in the same bucket as sort of climate change, uh, right? You, you, we're, pushing, we're pushing these issues off to, to the next generation. Um, and, and that is, um, you know, that's the, the, the challenge. One of the challenges with a um, democratic capitalist system is that we live for very much for today. There isn't enough sort of balance for the future, if we will. So as long as we continue to push off all of our problems to the future, uh, and we do that because we don't want to take the medicine for the for the present. So I don't mean to end on a on a, on a negative note, but we we make it a problem for the uh, for the future, whether it's our, our budget deficit or the Earth's problems as it relates to uh, to to climate. So the short answer is, yeah, we we can always just um, print more, raise more revenue, and print more money, and that pushes it continues to push it off down the road. Well, yeah, the reason I ask the question is because it's what, what, what goes around the, the YouTube channels as they go, America's about to collapse, the entire system is about to collapse, they can't, they're going to default on their debt, etc. And, and so clients send you these things and you, you keep saying to them, look, this is not a reality for us right now. You know? No, it, it isn't. I mean, th th this is a whole nother webinar um, discussion on the rise and fall of civilizations, right, where we start talking about what brought down I mean, you just made the trip to Rome, which used to be the center of, if not the, the center of the of the world, the center of the universe, right? What 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 happened to 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 Rome and its rise and fall and the rise and fall of the Greek Empire and 
and other great empires around the world. That's a history discussion that 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 we could have that happens over sort of the over the, the centuries. Um, and uh, and those events do take centuries to to occur. So that can be that can be our next uh, client webinar, or sort of these philosophical, long-reaching discussions on on what will happen to modern democracy and the rise and fall of civilizations. Lovely. Excellent. What a note to end on there, gentlemen. Um, as always, uh, an interesting discussion. Thank you to the over 100 uh, participants that are still watching uh, right the way to the end. So uh, thank you all for taking time out of your schedule to come and listen. Thank you very much to, to Rob taking time out of his, uh, his busy diary from, from uh, for having me. Boston. Appreciate it. Very, very welcome. And Lawrence, thanks again for putting together such a, a fantastic event. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, have thanks a great everybody. day. Bye-bye. Cheers.